I start recording. The lecture number three, uh, Martin asked whether the whether lecture number three is uh, on YouTube. Yes, it is. I forgot to add the link, but there's a playlist called Morse Theory. So if you go to this playlist on YouTube, then all the free lectures are on that playlist. And the lecture and lecture number four will be on the playlist too. I hope the quality of the sound will be a bit better because I got mm, a better mic for the for the talk. So the plan for today is to prove the vector field integration lemma I announced on uh, I announced on mm, uh, like I announced two weeks ago. So what is the vector field in integration lemma? We have a a manifold n and we have a vector field xi on n and we want to obtain a function f from n to r such that d xi f mm, sorry that such that xi is a gradient like vector field uh, this of course uh, this function f if it exists uh, is uh, highly non-unique so there will be many choices uh, but of course this function f need not exist for example uh, if xi is gradient like well we know that xi is uh, gradient in some metric so for example you can't have a you can't have a cycle as a trajectory of xi trajectory of xi Okay, because well, if you have a cycle, you start with start at this point, you go, 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 your function increases along the cycle because the gradient like vec condition is greater than zero except at except at uh, at critical points. Uh, so you go, the fun the function f increases. Lo and behold, you come back to your own to the place you started in. So it can't be a cycle. Well, it can't be a union of trajectories, closed union of uh, you. You can't have a union of closed trajectories either. So, for example, you have a critical point P1, P2, P3, P4, and P5, and the trajectory and Sorry, that's uh, a bit too fast. Uh, and you have like, uh, this is not P4, the P4 is here. So you have like trajectories of Xi from P1 to P2, then from P2 to P3, then from P3 to P4, and from P4 to P1, then this can't happen. If this happens, you can't find, you can't, if this situation occurs, you can't possibly find a function f. Well, why is that so? The, the argument is the same as above. So fp2 is greater than fp1 because the function increases on trajectory on non-constant trajectories of xi. f of p3 is greater than f of p2, and so on and so on. And then you come back to your critical point. So this is called, if you ask, this is called a circular broken trajectory. Which means it's not a trajectory because it's a union of trajectories. So instead, uh, it will be quite useful for us to say, instead of union of trajectories, to use the terminology broken trajectory, which is like a trajectory, a union of trajectories connecting consecutive critical points. And circular means it starts and ends up at the same point. Okay, so this is an abstraction. And of course, if you have a gradient vector field, then you know that, uh, so if you look at the differential equation df of gamma of t, then you know that limit and exist. This is a standard problem in, um, of course, in 
and compact. It existed, it's a critical point. So why can you, how can you prove it? Well, it's a standard problem in uh, ordinary differential equations. Uh, I think I forgot to give it as a homework last year. I get, uh, I, I taught ODEs, but it's uh, approximately that that level. Um, so how can you prove it? Well, you know that there is a limit. Mm. <clears throat> uh, you know that there is a, a limit on a, on each subsequence because n is compact. So this has a convergent subsequence. This guy has convergent subsequence as t goes to infinity. And then you look at the derivative that you have to stay in the region that uh, you cannot come back. So the function f goes up. So uh, you estimate the derivative of f because you have to slow down. And then you show that you have to come close to a critical point. And you have to come close to infinity uh, to this critical point infinity many, infinity many times. So for that, probably you need to assume, but that's uh, you need not to assume that it's Morse, but F has isolated singularities. I'm not sure if it's true if F has non isolated singularities. Maybe it's actually a good homework for for you, unless uh, any of you sees uh, immediate. Uh, immediate reasons. So we captured like three, like two phenomena. One is uh, existence of the limit and see that not having a cycle as a limit is a sub phenomenon. So it's uh, this, this is stronger condition that the, the forward limit and the backward limit exist. And second condition is no circular trajectories. And since we want F to be Morse, we need to us to impose uh, some local condition on station, stationary points. So it should look like a gradient of a Morse function near each stationary point. So that comes us to the theorem. Uh, we don't actually need to use this theorem uh, that uh, there is a metric that uh, xi is a gradient vector field because all those uh, conditions can be reform reformulated uh in the conditions that were used to define the gradient like vector field yes, right for sure but the gradient like vector field has the same shape near a critical point so there is a state there is in the definition of a gradient like vector field there is a condition that near each stationary point so near each critical point of xi there are local coordinates such that xi has four minus x1 minus x2 minus xh xh plus one up to xn Yes, but we also uh, assumed that the f of uh, this vector field is always positive, uh, non-negative, and that it's uh, zero only for critical points. Yes, yes. So uh, if we have this, then we don't need uh, then we don't need to pass to the, some real gradient to just formulate those uh, problems in terms of d f and v. Uh, I'm not sure if I if I'm able to follow your remark. We so I need. I, to... mean, I mean, the, for instance, to show that there are no, no circular vector fields, instead of looking at uh, instead of looking at the gradient, we can just look at the derivative of f in the direction oh, of xi. Yes, the... sure. For that, for for this, yes. For this, yes. Sure. Mm -hmm. For this condition, yes. And for this condition as well. Yes. But for the statement of this, now, now I understand your remark. OK, so there is a theorem. Uh, vector field integration lemma. A variant of this theorem, much weaker, will be used in the proof of cancel handle cancellation lemma later on. But it gives us a. a like I feel the picture is incomplete without this statement. So the the more theoretical picture is incomplete. Uh, integration lemma. Suppose, and it was first proof uh, in that form. Uh, Two thousand sixteen, and then there is another proof in the. Uh, 
uh, in a forthcoming paper. So this proof has uh, a gap and it's uh, one of the, an element of the homework to find this gap. Uh, it's uh, very tough. Uh, uh, RFE was very careful reading the paper, but didn't. And we, we, we wrote, read it very carefully too, but we didn't capture it until I started. Uh, mm -hmm. So this guy, this is published. This is published in, uh, you can find it uh, on, on the archive or on the, um, um, uh, on the um, journal's webpage. So suppose N is a closed, or maybe M is a closed smooth manifold. Psi is a vector field on N, and of course, smooth vector field such that, well, first, let me call it condition number one, and it's, I give it a name, local behavior. Mm. This is uh, the behavior that Xi has finite, finitely many crits uh, near each critical point, point P, there exist H and local coordinates, or maybe H is a bad letter. Maybe, uh, what is the letter that can be, maybe D, X1 up to Xn, such that Xi is minus X1 minus Xd, Xd plus one, Xn, or alternatively Xi is minus some xi d over dxi for i equal one to d plus some xi d of dxi i equal d plus one to n. Uh, of course, uh, there is the missing factor two. Uh, you can have it, you can, you, you need not have it. Okay, so maybe I can put here the factor two in a different color or here one half xi. Okay, so that's because uh, uh, this is like just a pure technicality. So this is like condition first local behavior. Okay, that's because we want f the, the function that we get to, to be Morse. So there is a second condition. Second condition is uh, mm, not found in pen, but uh, condition number two alpha and omega limits. So if you don't know the alpha limit set and omega limit set are just, so this is condition about this guy. For any z in N, a trajectory uh, sorry, that trajectory. Of xi. The, tra the trajectory gamma of xi through z. Uh, has the properties has the properties a lim t2 infinity gamma of t exists and is a mm, critical point of xi b lim t2 minus infinity gamma of t exists and is a critical point of xi so this is what I said, and 
why I'm using the for the notion alpha and omega limit. That's uh, the that's a standard terminology in qualitative theory of uh, uh, ODEs. Alpha limit set the the omega limit set is the lim the set of all uh, accumulation points of uh, gamma of t as uh, t goes to infinity. So if you take all possible subsequences of uh, mm, of mm, of uh, real subsequences that go to infinity mm, and uh, look at gamma of this subsequence and look at the limit that you get. So that's the omega limit set and the omega limit set is a single point if a trajectory abuts in one point. That's the uh, that's a statement. So that's number two. This is our condition. And number three is uh, Mm. No circular trajectories. This was this is not implied by condition number two. No. Tra trajectories. Oh, uh, uh, sorry. Yes. Exactly. What it means, and then the statement. There exists f from n to r. Uh, it's n uh, used to be m, but I switched to n. Uh, I think for in my, in the mood I'm now, it's much better to use n. I'm sorry about that. Uh, such that f is Morse, d and xi is gradient like. So what is the purpose of this statement? So maybe I, uh, for the moment, uh, like. Exists a Riemannian, a Riemannian metric uh, such that a gradient like vector field for F is an honest gradient. Uh, it's a question for you. Are you going to prove it or not? I can give you a hint and, uh, well, the proof is, I can give you a hint now and you try to prove it by, by your own. It's much easier to, prove it by your, on yourself than to uh, read somebody else's proof. That's uh -huh. one of the features of Morse theory. So I will <laughs> tell you, give you a hint. A hint is you have the, hmm, first of all, if you have two metric, if you have <laughs> metric defined, uh, metrics defined locally, such that Xi is a gradient like vector field, you can glue them together to a global metric by using partition of unity. That's one mm -hmm. tool. Second tool is near each critical point, you, mm, you can define the metric explicitly in local coordinates. And three, near uh, in a neighborhood of a non-critical point, you use rectification lemma. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So that's, uh, that's, that's essentially the proof and uh, details are left for you. Mm -hmm, thanks. Okay, so second, this condition, let me recall while it's recording. Uh, this condition is uh, about a single trajectory. It tells you about a single trajectory and this condition is about a set of trajectories. It doesn't tell you about a single trajectory. Well, they're, they're but about different trajectories of the same vector field. Okay, so let me start proving it. And uh, here actually the proof is uh, at least the first part of the proof. Uh, of course, as in more theory, at some moment uh, giving more details, more and more details uh, gives you um, more confusion, but the ideas of the proof are very, are, in my opinion, very instructive in Morse theory. This is the way how I think about Morse theory. So first of all, 
come back to this picture from last lecture. You can open it on your computer. I will copy it maybe. Oh no, stop that. Here it is. So what was this, this guy? This guy was uh, given by uh, the set of equations uh, um, x1 square plus xn square less or equal than delta uh, minus x1 square minus xk square x d square plus x d. I'm using d because uh, my n and k and h uh, are sometimes uh, too, too similar one to another. Epsilon and uh, x uh, D, uh, not the square is here, xd square multiplied by xd plus one square plus x and square is less or equal than one fourth d square minus epsilon square. Okay, so let me call this set p delta epsilon. Okay, so this is and what was its properties? The p delta, the boundary of p delta epsilon uh, is p minus union p plus union p vertical. I'm using a slightly different notation than last time. So p minus is, uh, let me call it uh, here, the orange one, two, three, two is equal to mm, uh, minus epsilon, two is equal to plus epsilon, and the vertical boundary is three is equality. Okay, so if in the second, this expression is minus epsilon, then we are on P minus, so this is, this, this is P minus, this is the P plus is the outgoing and vertical is the tangent. Okay, so this is the, the tangent part. You probably should remember that. Uh, this, is a, this is a nice uh, 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 nice picture to keep and <clears throat> Now we, can I scroll it? I, I should choose. Uh, for any P in the set of critical point of Xi, choose P delta P epsilon P P near P. Uh, maybe this is bad letter. R is better because it's not PP. Uh, and this is R minus R plus R vertical. That's too much. RP near P. Uh, so we choose critical point near each, near each P. And in such a way that the different RPs, the different RPs, RPs are disjoint. Okay, because we, what is our purpose? Our idea is to, uh, can you see me or you just, uh, because I can see myself, uh, maybe I should, uh, uh, Check. Yes, you can. You can see me. Okay. So the idea is to define the function first on near critical points, and then to smear it 
over the whole of um, the whole of n. So first we we want to define the function f and how can we define? Well, we have we don't have much choice. We have uh, critical points. So here are critical points. We have local coordinates. So we can define the function f in local coordinates to be like minus x1 squared minus xd squared plus this, plus some constant which we are going to choose. OK? So we have not much choice uh, in some local coordinate. It's some uh, uh, in the neighborhoods of critical points, we, we have to uh, uh, we have to act like this, but there is one statement that we need. And there is a lemma that is, uh, I guess, uh, equally interesting as the whole proof. Uh, the proof of the lemma. For any P, there exists delta p epsilon p such that if a trajectory of psi leaves mm, mm, Leaves uh, R P delta P epsilon P. Sorry for uh, uh, not this epsilon, this epsilon. Then it never returns to R P again. So what happens? So what is the situation? Let me redraw this. Rp in a more sug suggestive way. So we have a critical point. This is Rp minus, this is Rp plus, this is Rp vertical. So what happens? We want to define a function here, but it might get, happen that we define the function, we start with this function here, and we go, we leave the trajectory, we can leave it by the definition of Rp. We leave it only to this, to Rp plus, we leave it, leave it, leave it, we return, and we come back here. So the function here that is going to that we are going to define is bigger than the function here. So we can't possibly have the situation that we start in this point uh, and end up in that point. So for that, if, if this happens, then we are screwed. The function can exist because we get contradiction. We on the one hand we define we have defined the function the only way we can, like minus x1 square minus xd square plus blah, blah, blah. And then on the other hand, the function, the trajectory starting from here ends up in here. And it is, uh, uh, so the function here should be greater than the function on the top. So we have to exclude the situation that what the lemma tells us. How do we do that? Well, mm, Come back to that picture, and uh, uh, mm, say proof of the lemma. Fix epsilon greater than zero. Suppose for any delta greater than zero, suppose towards contradiction, that the statement doesn't hold for delta. What does it mean? It means that we have a point we call it x delta that and the trajectory
Xi and here is Y delta. Okay. Uh, sorry, for each delta not greater than zero. It's a bit more subtle for each uh, delta greater than epsilon. Okay, so this is, uh, this is uh, the statement and we keep epsilon greater than zero. Mm. So we draw it. So this is like a picture of our P4 fixed the delta zero epsilon, but smaller and smaller uh, shrinking delta shrinks your picture. So we have like a se sequence of X deltas and the sequence of Y deltas. So pick X delta and Y delta X delta belongs to R plus, Y delta belongs to R minus. And there is a trajectory gamma delta from, from R plus to R minus. Okay, so now the, now we can say like, uh, instead of, uh, all possible deltas, we can just take x one over m. Uh, uh, sorry, x uh, m equal x epsilon plus one over m and y m equal y epsilon plus one over m. So that we reparameterize to get the finite sequence. And now this is compact and that is compact. So they so XMs and YMs tend uh, have a have a convergent subsequence on on passing to a subsequence. We have we can assume that XM text tends to X zero and YM tends to Y zero for some X zero and Y zero. And where does the Y zero and X zero sit? Well, they set they sit. Well, delta is uh, delta is now uh, in the space were like x zeros first. This has to be equal to epsilon because we are on R, R plus. This has to be equal to epsilon or smaller than epsilon plus anything. So equal to epsilon. So, and this has to be zero. So R plus, so x zero sits precisely on the unstable manifold of Mm, of the critical point. So now I say uh, X zero belongs to the intersection of R, uh, R delta zero del epsilon P with the unstable manifold of P and Y zero P uh, plus uh, sorry, here should be, here should be minus, here should be plus, intersected with, uh, is this clear? So this is, this is an important moment. Is this clear? Can someone say if it's clear or unclear? Too bad, okay. Spend, I need to spend a, a bit more to... I'm copying the picture so that I can redraw it, keeping it uh, Bigger. So this is like I said, the most important picture in Morse theory, probably. Uh, so.
Well, maybe it is. These are concentric circles. Uh, so this is like the, these are balls that, Mm. <coughs> mm. Uh, uh, sorry, 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 this is wrong. Hmm. Uh, okay, so what is here? Here is uh, f equals to epsilon. This is f equals to epsilon, the uh, minus epsilon. This is f equals to epsilon. This is f equals to epsilon. So the trajectories go in this way. And uh, oh no 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 uh, that was epsilon uh, now it's lost forever uh, f equals epsilon f equals epsilon so this is the exit set. Uh, we go to this. We go also to this. We are tangent to this set, but this should be drawn in a slightly better, slightly different manner. So like, and we enter all the regions through here. So where does the, so this is like a picture and decrease, decreasing Delta leads us from this ball to smaller and smaller balls until we reach the moment where the mm, where delta is equal to epsilon but if delta is equal to epsilon then the set degenerates to two to, to vertical lines so where, where is that so well you see if you substitute here epsilon for delta then this is so. Then this equation, this inequality, gives you uh, this times this is equal to is less than zero. So it has to be equal to zero. So you get either this is zero or that is zero. So you, so it degenerates to, to two lines which are like stable the unstable union of stable and the unstable manifolds of of R. 
So what is, where does our X delta sit? Where X delta is a point somewhere in here and then somewhere in here, and then it converges to something in here. And Y delta is the entry set. So it starts in here and it, if uh, it can converge only to anything in here. Is it more clear now? I can't really see what you're drawing at the moment. Uh, okay, so X delta is here, okay? Mm -hmm. And now we, sh we shrink delta and we assume that X delta ex still exists. So mm -hmm. we decrease the radius of the ball. And if we decrease the radius of the ball, then this region that was like this, becomes smaller region, okay? And then in the limit, it is precisely this two, this cross in the middle. Okay, so mm -hmm. if I shrink X delta on the boundary of this region, then it will eventually hit the purple part, the, the, the purple cross in the middle. Uh, mm -hmm. in in the middle and the same is for y delta you start in here and when you decrease delta you hit the other the vertical line of the cross in the uh, uh, in the middle mm -hmm. is this clear now yes for someone somebody else in marching too i think that's pretty pretty clear okay okay so this is like one step. So we have x0 to and y0 coming and uh, now comes the the point, uh, the subtle point and we use the assumption. What happens when we start at eight x zero and go along along xi. Well, we know that we start at x delta, then we eventually reach y delta. We know that x delta converges to x zero. We know that y delta converges to y zero. So the like the uh, naive guess uh, would be that if we start from X zero, then we go to Y zero, okay? This is, for the moment I say it's naive guess, it's not necessarily true, but suppose for the moment that it's true. <clears throat> and I will tell you how does, how from this goes, uh, you get the proof, okay? So, suppo uh, suppose x uh, zero a trajectory from x zero reaches y zero trajectory of xi. So we have like gamma of t, gamma of zero, say is equal to x zero, gamma of t is equal to y zero for t greater than, for some, for, for some t. What is the limit at t goes to infinity, y, uh, gamma of t? Can we say something about it? Any ideas? Assume that it's that it exists and. Uh... 
Yes, no, we have finished for, the tra for, for a trajectory of... Yeah, we know that it exists and it's a critical point of sign. A which? Mm, both of them. Okay, so no, no, no. So we saw... We, look at what we proved in the moment that X naught belongs to the unstable manifold of the critical P, point P, and Y naught belongs to the stable manifold of the critical point P. So here it was, this was the limit of Y naught, it was the stable point, and X naught, X, X naught was here, it was an unstable. If X zero is on the unstable manifold of the critical point P, then this means, and the, then the, this means that the trajectory through X naught hits the critical point P in the infinite past. And if Y not belongs to the, the unstable manifold, Y not belongs to the stable manifold of the critical point P, then this is the same as saying that the trajectory through, of, through that point, and the gamma is a trajectory through Y not, hits the critical point P in the infinite future. Okay? This is a broken circular, actually unbroken, but it's uh, not that the circular trajectory, which is a contradiction. Okay, we Prove that if it happens, then X naught must belong to the unstable manifold. Y naught must belong to the stable manifold. So we get a trajectory from here to here. Well, the, a suggestive picture is that here we have a stable manifold, here we have the unstable manifold, and the trajectory is from here to here. It's a broken trajectory. Okay? That is. That is the argument. Is it uh, more or less clear? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So now we have to analyze this naive guess. Uh, does anybody have uh, have an idea how is why it's true or why should it be true or why can it be false or what is the problem here? Let me maybe just switch the notation to x x m. Okay, there is a statement that we probably all know that there is a continuous dependence on, of a solution of ODEs on initial conditions. Okay, so the continuous dependence should tell us that, well, the limit of trajectory is still a trajectory. But there is a subtlety here. The subtlety here is that the continuous dependence uh, only uses, uh, like involves, uh, finite time. So that's why I said that's a naive guess and then we explain it. So let, let gamma m be such that gamma m of zero is xm, gamma m dot is equal to xi of gamma m, and let's tm is the moment that gamma m of tm is equal to ym. So we have like two possibilities. One, tm is an unbounded sequence. Two, tm is bounded.
So if Tm is bounded, then Tm tends to some so T zero less than infinity. Well, up to passing to a subsequent to a convergent subsequence, of course. Mm. And then we consider gamma naught such that gamma naught is of zero is x naught and gamma dot psi of gamma zero, and then claim gamma naught of t naught is equal y naught. And this is a consequence. of the dependence of <coughs> solutions on initial conditions. <coughs> Is this clear? I think so. Yes, this is the smoothness of the flow. If the flow is smooth, then the the flow is like psi t from uh, n to n that takes a point to a, to, to a point, or it gives you a, like a map from n r to n, and this is a continuous map or a smooth map. So you know what is this what is this map in ODEs? Yes, it takes a point where we start, time where we go, and it gives you the point where we that we reach. And this is a smooth map. So if it's a smooth map, then if Tm goes to T0 and Xm goes to Ym, then X0 goes to Y0. That's the that's the smoothness of the flow. But of course, uh, uh, This is two, so this is the case two. But we can, but if this happens, then we don't know. We don't have a control. So what ha what ha what can happen? Assume one. We know that gamma not boots in a, a, a critical point p prime okay i will show that p prime So we can, if p prime is p, then it's okay. Yeah, uh, we know it. We know it from the assumption that each trajectory has a one point. So we have gamma not of p. Mm. So there exists a point p prime. Gamma not of t is equal to p prime. If uh, mm, If p prime is equal to p, then we have uh, the same story. So we have a so we we know that lib t to my to minus infinity gamma not of oh sorry uh, gamma of uh, t is equal p. So we get a circular trajectory. So the only case we need uh, we need to consider is suppose p prime is not p. So what happens? I have my point my rp
and I have my RP prime. I start at X naught, I hit P prime. So I have a trajectory that goes in here. This is gamma naught. Now, this trajectory goes in the infinite time to P prime, but to that point, it takes finite time. Okay? Uh, is it clear? It has, it is a trajectory connecting two points. Let me call this point Z naught. So if I take like a sequence, there was a sequence XM, YM, and I start from XM in here, then, and M is sufficiently close, then I hit this point. So what does it tell me? It tells me that if I have a nearby trajectory, then it has to enter this region RP prime. Of course, I know that the light green trajectory eventually hits point Y I'm in here. So if I enter RP prime, I have to exit from it. Okay, because uh, I can't stay forever in RP prime because if I stay in forever in RP prime, I will never hit YM. So I stay in RP prime and then I hit this, uh, then I have to leave. I leave it at a point UM in here. Okay. And I choose the, of course, the top is compact. So I have a sequence UM. If I have a sequence UM, then I can pass to a convergent subsequence U0. And now there are two possibilities. What is the trajectory gamma tilde So what is the limit? Uh, sorry, gamma, gamma tilde of t. Well, there are two possibilities. Either I start starting here, I leave, uh, I leave the, uh, I, if I go back, I leave, I cross this line or I stay forever. If I stay forever, then I have to go to P prime. If I leave it, then I can leave it by continuous dependence only at the point C zero. Because I can't leave in any other point because uh, if I leave, I leave in finite time, UM is the accumulation point of U naught and ZM is the, is the accumulation point of Z naught. If I start at, at UM and go back, I leave at ZM. So if I start at U naught and I go back, if I leave, I have to leave at Z naught. But I can't leave at Z naught because if I start at Z naught, I hit P prime. And this tells me that the trajectory through U naught goes back to P prime. Okay, is this clear for this moment? If you see this argument for the first time, it might be too fast. I'm teaching it for the first time, but uh, I have seen it like uh, 20 times in my life. So it's, it may be, might be harder. Is it clear? Is it clear that a trajectory from U not hits P prime? Yeah, more or less. And is it clear that the trajectory from Z from XM has to hit R P prime? Mm -hmm. from unless, unless it hits, uh, why not? 
well from uh, if x naught doesn't hit uh, doesn't appear uh, in p only in some other p prime then x the trajectory from xm for m sufficiently large has to mm -hmm. hit zm okay mm -hmm. and then if it hits zm it has to leave through um and then you go back to to that mm -hmm. so from x naught you hit z naught you need to hit p prime so from u naught backwards you hit p, you p prime okay so what is the picture now maybe it's a good moment to so we iterate the procedure and we at some moment we re reach the the critical point or if we don't reach the critical point the uh, sorry if we don't reach why not we reach some other region but we reach a region that we have already been into so what does it what is the blue curve what so what is the grid curve now it's a union of trajectories from p to p prime from p, pri p prime to p double prime and from p double prime maybe through some other critical points to p so this is a circular broken trajectory and this is a contradiction so this is a circular broken trajectory that we have to that we wanted to get rid of uh, that we only had finitely many critical did we assume that we only had finitely many critical points well we assumed that uh, uh, first we, firstly we assume that n is compact okay so then we assume that near each critical point we have some uh, some coordinates where is the assumptions Yes, the, the assumptions are here, okay? We have local coordinates. So how can we prove that it's compact? Take uh, that, it, that there are finitely many, it's a simple argument that we can use. So let me make a side remark in here. Let me call, so these coordinates are defined in some ball, uh, in some small ball near a, near a critical point P. So take a, an open ball of uh, mm, uh, radius b1 and b2. Wait, is this a good? Uh, maybe we should assume it, OK? OK, so let's be safe and assume that there are finitely many critical. Uh, oh, sorry. Now I read what I wrote. Xi has finitely many critical points. Okay. So yes, it's in here. We have already assumed that. So it doesn't need does not need to fight fight for it. Mm. Okay, so the upshot is that uh if we start, if we have critical point x naught, sorry, if we have the exit point x naught and y naught, then either we can connect x naught with to y naught by a standard trajectory, or we can connect, we find a broken trajectory, maybe not unique, that uh, connects these two critical points. Okay, that is the. Um, uh, uh, that is uh, the statement. And there is a moral, and the moral is important, which is like a, a motto, which we are going to use anyway uh, several times in the future. So that's important a limit of trajectory of a gradient like vector field is a broken trajectory this is not a this is not a mathematical statement it's not a rigorous mathematical uh, uh, mathematical statement but it's like a statement that tells you uh, how do you think about limits of trajectories a limit of trajectory is either a trajectory or a broken trajectory and of course, it's not precise because I don't say what uh, what do I mean by a limit. 
but um, after the proof, after seeing the proof, is uh, you should be able to like uh, adjust the exact statement to your particular needs. So, I think it should be run be something like is it possibly broken tra trajectory because it might be a non broken trend. Yes, it might be. Well, it's uh, like a matter of philosophy whether you call a bro an unbroken trajectory a special case of a broken trajectory or not. Usually, uh, you don't call uh, uh, an unbroken leg a special case of a broken leg, but uh, you know we are not doctors; we are mathematical mathematicians. So we have proved that there. Where are we? We have proved that there exists. Delta P epsilon P for each P such that a trajectory of Xi leaving RP well RP delta P epsilon P does never return to rp again okay that's what we have proved by matter by assuming the converse and reaching the contra contradiction so come back to proof of the vector field integration lemma <coughs> so uh, mm, introduce partial order on the on the critical points. We say like p is smaller than p prime, smaller or equal, if. there exists a trajectory of Xi leaving RP and hitting RP prime, let me make precise in the future. And P, if P, P prime and not equal p prime. Mm. Maybe I should say, say just say that. No, it's uh, let's write it like this: p is less than p prime if there exists a trajectory of psi leaving p r p and hitting r p prime in the future. Okay, and this is an, a partial order because of what we have proved. You cannot start what we said is rp sorry p is less than p prime then it is not true that p prime is less than p okay it is not a circular order it's a why it's the case well p is less than p prime then it means that you have a trajectory from RP to RP prime. But if you have also a trajectory from RP prime to RP, then you have a trajectory that starts, that leaves RP and hits RP again, and it's not true. So now, assign a real number. RP mm, sorry our real number CP to each 
of the crit of Xi in such a way that if P is less than P prime, then CP plus epsilon P is less than CP prime minus epsilon P prime. Okay, so what is the meaning? Define F on RP to be F of X1 Xn equal minus X1 square minus X dp square uh, dp square plus x dp plus one square plus x and square plus cp. So what is the picture? We have a trajectory. We have rp, have rp prime. We have a there exists a trajectory from RP to RP prime. So CP plus epsilon P is the value of function F in here. And C prime P uh, CP prime minus epsilon P prime is the value of the function here. So if, if we have a trajectory from RP to RP prime, then the value of the function here should better be smaller than the value of the function here. So that's the explanation of this assignment. The choice is arbitrary. We can choose CP and CP prime the way we want. <coughs> okay. So now we draw the picture. And for example, since n is compact, uh, we have, and the number of critical points is finite, we have uh, assigned, uh, there is a, the function has a global minimum. So we have chosen a global minimum and we have chosen a global maximum. So we have like a situation on the picture and this is gonna be, uh, I'm sorry, I need to do this because I will try to copy the picture from the, oh, there is no picture in this version of the paper. Okay, so I will not copy it. Uh, we have like the whole of N and we have like here the, are sorry let me call it n minus we have n plus i will explain you what n minus and n plus are so maybe i will use the color to shade n minus and to to shade uh, n plus uh, uh, or the opposite and now i Uh, for the sake of the proof, I would like to assume that uh, CPs are the CPs are apart one from another in such a way that uh, this holds uh, for this inequality holds for any two critical points of P. Uh, uh, like if you, if I have two critical points. P and P prime, then either this holds or the opposite, like with P prime with sw swapped with P. Uh, and if P is smaller than P prime, then this holds. Okay, so that at each potential level set, I have only one RP uh, involved. So I will show you how to. So the picture will be slightly different. We have like a situation like this. Okay, so suppose F is already defined 
on n minus and n plus. So above some level set, we it's defined and below some level sets. So like n minus is defined as the set where f is greater than like some, uh, sorry, n plus is greater than b. And minus is like f is later smaller than some a. So here is a and b. And now creates, uh, okay, so how to say it. Uh, I want to have a place to start and I want to have a place to end. So a place to start is a place, uh, is this level set and this level set. So I have to define the function somewhere. I choose first my f on all the RPs and I choose, let me just re rewrite it, a real number CP to each of the critical points in such a way that I replace it for any PP prime, either CP plus epsilon P less than CP prime minus epsilon pi or CP minus epsilon P is greater than CP prime plus epsilon prime two. If P less than P prime, then the first holds. So I have like this CP spread apart. So I want to start, uh, so choose a CP with smallest P with, sorry, P with smallest CP. And uh, choose P with smallest CP. And let me call it P minus and P with largest CP and we call it P plus. So what does it tell me? Then P, P, P minus is the global minimum of F. It's a candidate for the global minimum and P plus is a candidate for the global maximum of F. So I define and minus initially, it's like initial step is uh, RP minus and N plus is equal RP plus. And I will define the level set A to be CP minus plus epsilon and B is equal to CP plus minus epsilon. So here is, here is B, here is A. And I want to define my function F uh, to have values away from n minus and n plus to have values in the interval a, b. Okay, and why I define it like this? I will. I want to define it inductively. Uh, uh, I want to define it inductively uh, with respect to the number of critical points inside the region, uh, the w's region, uh, n minus union and plus and minus. So um, how do I do it? Well, so this is like the initial step and now there, there comes uh, inductive definition, which is not, uh, uh, not very hard. The first key situation is, so let me call it N zero is n minus n plus and n minus. So n is, n zero is everything in here. So suppose, so the, I'm running out of time. So I will just tell you the, the first step and the next step will be given next week. Suppose F has no critical points on and not. So suppose here these are non-existent. So then take a point z in n zero and let's say gamma of t is uh, Mm, uh, trajectory, so gamma of 
zero is gamma z of zero is uh, z, gamma z dot is equal to psi of gamma z. So let's look at the trajectory. So what is the limit t to infinity gamma z and what is the limit t to minus infinity gamma z? Well, the limit exists. That's what that, that was our assumption. The limits exist both in both limits exist. Okay, so this limit and that limit both exist. Uh, okay, so far so good, but no critical points in n naught. So the trajectory has to leave n naught. But if the trajectory wants to leave n naught, it will it has to hit either n plus or n minus. But the trajectory, the limit point, can hit only n, n plus because we can't hit back n minus. Because we know that the trajectory flows out of n minus. Because our definition was that it's rp minus. And we know that the trajectory floats into n plus. So we have to belong to n minus. So there is a t plus such that gamma z of t plus belongs to the boundary of n plus. And there is t minus such that gamma z of t minus dn minus. Okay, we have a trajectory. Maybe I will choose uh, different colors. So we have a trajectory and it goes up. It can't hit a critical point because the critical points are not there and it can't hit the critical point back in here. But we def the function f is already defined in n plus and in n minus. In particular, on the boundary, the function f is just uh, is just uh, equal to b, and in in this point, it's just equal to a. So what we do, we set f of z is equal to b t plus plus a t minus over t plus minus t minus. Like we interpolate. So what happens if, uh, mm, uh, the function is increasing along the trajectories and uh, We can check because the, fu the function f as, as defined is increasing along trajectories and it interpolates between the level set a and the level set b using the trajectories. We can show that f is smooth except possibly at the boundary of and plus and and minus but then you can just uh, you can just uh, try to uh, um, use some extra extra arguments to to obtain it uh, to obtain the smoothness so if there are no critical points in n naught so if these don't exist we can extend now the next step will be to extend and that's what we're going to do next week to extend to this level set then to extend through that part then from that between that part to that part and between this part and this part and so on so we will do inductive arguments to extend the function uh, to extend the function uh, further and further and i think that's the good moment to stop uh,